This lecture is on sampling. After this lecture, you should be able to define three sampling problems that lead to bias samples. Explain why a random sample is likely to be more representative, a, a representative sample, and why representative samples have external validity to a particular population. You should know five techniques for random sampling, and then also three techniques for non-random sampling. Um, explain why representative samples may be especially important for make frequency claims. Consider times when an unrepresentative sample may be appropriate. And then explain why it's more important to ask how a sample was collected rather than how large it is. All right, first, just some basic terminology. When we refer to a population, we're talking about all people of interest. Okay, so this is the entire set of people or things that we're interested in. So this could be um, uh, all men or all women or all college students, um, or it could be all first year college students enrolled at your particular college or university. A sample is a smaller set of people or things that is taken from that population. Uh, a census is would be if you sample every member of the population. Uh, so if, for example, your population of interest is every first year college student at your college and you find some way to enroll uh, every single uh, first year college student at your college, then you're conducting a, a census. So really, we have to answer this question, what is the population of interest? When, first, when researchers refer to the population of interest, they're not talking about the entire population of the world, but just whatever population they want their research findings to generalize to. So um, it, it, it sometimes and often populations are large, but they don't necessarily need to be. So here's just another um, diagram which differentiates populations versus samples. And again, populations could be very, very large, everyone in the world, or say all men or all women, it could be all college students, but we could get increasingly small. It just depends on how far we want to generalize. So our population might be all students at a specific college or all students at a specific college that are majoring in psychology or all students at a specific college that are majoring in psychology that are taking research methods in a particular semester. So it's really just how far we want to generalize our results to. So an important issue is one of representativeness. We want our sample to be typical of the broader population from which it's drawn. We want our results to generalize. We want our sample results to generalize to the population. So we're going to talk about what makes samples representative versus unrepresentative. So in order for a sample to be representative, it obviously must come from the population, but we also need to consider how the sample was selected. Samples are either biased or they're unbiased, which means they're representative of the population for which, from which they're drawn. In a biased sample, which is unrepresentative, not all members of a population have an equal probability of being included. However, in an unbiased sample, which is a representative sample, all members of the population do have an equal probability of being included. We can only make inferences from a sample to a population of interest when we have a representative sample. Or I should say, we can only be confident in our inferences from a sample to a population when we have a representative or unbiased sample. So in the table below, you can see that you could use either a biased or an unbiased technique or sample in order to um, obtain a sample from a population of interest. And so there's some examples in that table. Okay.
So in order to get an unbiased sample, what we want to do is use a probability sampling technique. So this is otherwise known as random sampling. And this is which it, it, where every member of a population of interest has an equal chance of being selected. There are a number of different kinds of random sampling. And so we're going to learn about five different techniques. So the first technique is just called simple random sampling. And this is when each person in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So you could think about giving each person some sort of unique identifier, like a number, and then using a completely random process to select a sample from a population. So putting those numbers on, on lottery balls and, and uh, you know, using a, a process similar to like running a lottery. Um, there's computerized methods and software methods, but with a simple random sample, every single person in the population has an equal chance of being selected. Another technique that you could use is systematic sampling. With systematic sampling, the population is arranged according to some ordering scheme, and then people or elements are selected at regular intervals. So the size of the interval is determined by taking the size of the population and then dividing by the desired sample size. So let's just say, for example, your population has 20,000 people in it and you want a sample of 2,000, the appropriate sampling interval would be 10 because you just divide 20,000 by 2,000. Then to start the sampling process, you take a random number between 1 and 10. Okay, so you take a random number between 1 and 10. Let's just say we got a 7 in doing that process. That would be the first element or the first person, and then you take the every 10th person after that. So if we, um, I've got the yellow pages here, but back in the old days, you could take a telephone book from a particular community. Everybody is listed in the telephone book. You determine if you've got 20,000 people in your town and you want 2,000 people, you start any, anywhere from the first to the 10th person and then you just go every 10th um, every person. That's how you do a, a systematic um, sampling technique. Okay, stratified random sampling is a multi-stage technique in which a researcher selects specific demographic categories like race or gender and then randomly selects individuals from each of these categories. So this is random sampling, but it's done within strata. Okay, so there's the restriction that important subgroups have to be proportionally represented in the sample. So you have to take your population and divide that into strata or subgroups. And then you use a random sampling procedure within each strata. And so this gives a researcher control to ensure that each subgroup is represented. represented. So let's just say, here's my example that I have on the slide. If a researcher is doing a study in a high school and in that high school, there's approximately equal numbers of freshmen, sophomore, junior, and senior. So they want their sample to have, um, you know, an equivalent proportion of freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. So what they would do is they would divide their population into these four strata and then use a random sampling technique within each strata. Okay, so whatever the final number was, they would want to make sure to end up with equal numbers or an equal proportion of freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, because that's essentially what the breakdown is in the population. Um, it's not necessary to have an equal number in each strata. So um, indeed, if you want your sample to be representative, in many cases, um, different 
race or ethnic groups are not uh, there, there's there's different numbers or different proportions um, in your population of interest. So let's just say you want to have a study in which you've got 1,000 people um, from the U.S. and um, you want to make sure that there is a proportional amount of people from South Asian descent and that's known that the proportion in the population is 4%. And so what you want to do then is have two categories or strata, um, those that are South Asian and then everybody else in the U.S., and then make sure to um, sample so that the, uh, the end result has 4% um, South Asian and then 96% everyone else. It's possible to do a variation of stratified random sampling called oversampling. And this is where a researcher overrepresents one or more groups. So let's just go back to that example where a researcher wants to sample a thousand people and make sure it's to include a, uh, enough South Asians in the sample. Well, if the researcher's population of interest has a low percentage of South Asians, like it, let's just say it's 4%, 40 individuals, which is 4% of 1,000, isn't enough to make accurate statistical estimates. So what the researcher might do then is oversample people from the South Asian community, and instead of giving getting 40, which would be 4%, might go up to 100, as a way of oversampling to make sure that that 100 could be used to provide more accurate statistical estimates. So in that case, you have to oversample a particular group. Okay. So in another probability sampling technique is called cluster sampling. Here, clusters of participants within a population of interest are randomly selected and then all individuals in each selected cluster are used. All right, so the important distinction here is that, or the difference between stratified sampling is with stratified sampling, you stratify your population and then you do a random sampling technique within each strata. Here, the random process is to randomly determine your clusters, and then you don't randomly sample within your cluster. You include every single individual in that cluster. So the random component is identifying the clusters. So here's an example. Let's just say you wanted to randomly sample high school students in the state of California. One way to do that, if you used a cluster technique, is you would start with a list of all the public high schools in California. So those public high schools would be your clusters. Then what you do is you randomly select, let's just say 100 of those high schools. And then what you do is include every single student from each of those 100 schools in the sample. Okay, so the random part is selecting which high schools. Once you've got the high schools, you're going to select every single student at that school. Um, a cluster technique is often used with face-to-face -face interviewing, and this is particularly the case if a population is dispersed over a broad uh, geographic region. If you think about doing a simple random sample, that would result in a sample that's too geographically dispersed and it would be impractical or too costly to interview every single person based on a, a simple random sample. So when interviewing is done and people have to go face to face to interview people, clusters are created based on neighborhoods and then people are interviewed within that particular cluster. So um, that's a way to make face to face interviewing or door to door interviewing um, more feasible. It's also possible to use a multi-stage sampling process. So here you get um, two random samples. You get a random sample of clusters, and then once you get a random sample of clusters, you can also randomly sample within that cluster. 
So if we went back to the high school example, we could take that list of high schools, randomly sample 100 high schools from the list, and then within each high school, we could do a random sampling process within that high school so that we wouldn't necessarily have to include every single person in the high school, but we could do a random uh, sample. So that would be a multi-stage sampling technique, cluster sampling, and then say a simple random sample within each cluster. Okay, so unbiased representative samples are very important when external validity and generalizing our results are a top priority. But there are times when external validity is not the most important priority. Sometimes it's a matter of um, internal validity and wanting to be able to make cause and effect conclusions. And so in these cases, there's four different techniques that can be used when um, external validity is not such a top priority. Okay, so one thing that is very common in, particularly in psychological research, is to use convenience samples. In convenience samples, participants are selected solely on the basis of convenience. So many of the participants in psychological research are undergraduate college students that are enrolled in introductory psychology classes. And they're participants in research studies simply because it's convenient for the researcher. Um, and so um, psychology has been criticized for having weird samples. That is, the samples uh, in, that are used in psychology and psychological research are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, or weird. Um, and so this can, there can be a problem of generalizability of the results. Another technique that can be used, which is a non-probability technique, is called purposive sampling. And this is when you want to study certain kinds of people, so you only recruit those types of participants. And so, as a very simple example, if you wanted to recruit people that were smokers because you wanted to uh, understand how to get people to quit smoking, you might recruit participants um, by putting up advertisements, and you would say, if you're a smoker, you are eligible to participate in this study. So, purposive sampling is done when there's a particular subgroup within a population uh, that you're interested in. And one reason that this is done is to make comparisons between known groups of people. So one example from psychological research is uh, studying people that are high versus low in a personality variable called need for closure. So, um, the need for closure refers to the desire for an answer on a given topic, any answer, compared to um, leaving it open or ambiguous. And so uh, what some researchers have done is try to identify people ahead of time and recruit people that they thought would be high versus low in need for closure. And so one study intentionally sampled accounting majors versus art majors at their university in order to study the psychological trait of need for closure. And the researchers reason that different personality types should be drawn to the different majors. Uh, people that prefer explicit ordered structured tasks should be drawn to accounting, and the people that prefer ambiguous free or unstructured activities should be drawn for art. So in order to come up with their uh, need for closure scale, which was a way to measure this personality trait, they did purposive sampling and they recruited people from those two different majors as a way to compare them. Okay. Snowball sampling is a variant of purposive sampling where there's a few members of a subgroup or subpopulation and you locate them and then each person of that subpopulation is asked to suggest other members of the subpopulation 
to contact. So this is given the name snowball sampling because the sample continues to grow one by one, just like a snowball rolling down a hill. So this technique is often used to study populations where it is difficult for res uh, researchers to gain access. So if you think about um, things that are difficult to study, so this could be crime or other illegal activity, drug use, prostitution, um, it can be difficult to find, uh, find and recruit people. So if you're able to get one member of that sub subpopulation as a participant, you would use a snowball technique and say, hey, could you um, please uh, refer or, or um, uh, pass on um, this study and, and the ability to participate in the study to people that you know? Um, but there could be other cases like trying to sample people with extreme political views um, or studying people that have a rare disease. Um, you know, you might start with one or two people that have the condition, but then ask uh, people that have that condition to recruit people they know from support groups. So um, anything that's difficult to study, uh, this is when a researcher would rely on their participants to help recruit people for them. Um, snowball sampling is, of course, unrepresentative because people are recruited via social networks, and this is not at random. Okay, so quota sampling is a type of uh, non-probability sample. It's similar to stratified random sampling, which is the the probability-based sampling, in that a researcher identifies subsets of a population that they're interested in, and then they set a target number, okay, a quota, in each subset or category of that sample. Um, however, instead of using a random sampling technique in uh, quota sampling, a non-random sampling technique is used, okay? So, for example, you might want a sample that is half men and half women, and then one third have to have less than a high school education, one third have to be high school graduates, one third have to have at least some college education. These quotas are imposed, and then you go about some sampling technique to make sure that you hit your quota. Okay, but the key difference between quota and stratified sampling is that quota uses a non-random sampling procedure, whereas stratified random sampling would use a random sampling technique. All right, so here's an overview of the technique. These are in the um, in the chap in the chapter. It's just a way to um, kind of a good heuristic for keeping the five uh, probability sampling techniques. Um, together and then keeping the four non-probability sampling techniques together. It's important not to confuse random sampling <coughs> excuse me, with random assignment. So with random sampling, we're creating a sample using some random method so that each member of the population of interest has an equal chance of being in the sample. And this method increases external validity. With random assignment, this is typically used in experiments where participants are randomly put into different groups, usually a treatment and a comparison group. And random assignment increases internal validity. Okay, so random sampling is associated with external validity and random assignment is associated with internal validity. So you could use uh, a convenient sample, like for example, um, college students that are in introductory psychology, and they could participate in an experiment, and people could be randomly assigned to condition. That would really be a matter of internal validity. So we could say that in that situation, there's high internal validity but there's not necessarily strong external validity.
Um, so is it ever okay to use a convenience sample or some other non-probability sample? Well, if external validity is the most important thing, then non-probability samples aren't so great. When providing frequency claims or when wanting to provide evidence for a frequency claim, external validity is really the top priority and using a probability sampling technique is, is necessary. However, when external validity is a lower priority, um, it's possible to, to, to not have a, uh, a random sampling technique. Okay. So uh, even though you need to have a probability sample to support a frequency claim, there's many associations or cause and effect relationships that can be accurately detected um, even using a non-probability sample. Um, and so just to give an example of a non-probability sample in the real world. Um, and even if you, so if you read research, and even if you know that the sample is not representative, you should think carefully about how much it actually matters. Um, and whether the characteristics that make the sample biased are actually relevant to whatever claim is being made. Um, and in certain cases, it's very reasonable to trust the reports of research even when you know there's an unrepresentative sample. Okay. So as one example, let's just say that we've got a driver that uses uh, the Waze navigation app and they report heavy traffic on a specific highway. Clearly that this driver is not a randomly selected uh, driver, right? And they're bound to be biased in a couple of different ways. So that person is likely to be much more conscientious because they're the ones that, are, that, are, that, that is on the app reporting the traffic problem. However, does the personality of the person using the app really matter? Traffic should be the same for everybody. It doesn't matter whether what my personality is Okay, I, I could be a conscientious person and the person in the car next to me could be not so conscientious, but we're sitting in the same traffic. So even the, though the driver is a non-random sample, the traffic, the traffic report can probably generalize to the other drivers on the road. Okay, so the feature that um, is, is biased in the sample, that is being a, of a conscientious personality type, is not really relevant to the variable which is being measured, which is the traffic. Okay, so that would be an example of saying, even though this information is coming from a biased sample, it doesn't really matter. Okay, let's take another example. So that would be in the real world. Let's take an example from, from research studies. So um, we've actually encountered some previous research from the previous chapter that used a non-probability sample. So recall from chapter six, there was research on um, the families that allowed researchers to videotape their evening activities um, around dinner time and things like that. Certainly there's a, only certain kinds of families that would let researchers walk around the house and record their behavior. And we have to think about, would this affect the conclusions of the study? It seems possible that a family that volunteers um, that and would allow people to come in and videotape them is more likely to have a much warmer emotional tone and are likely um, different than uh, the full population of people of dual earning, uh, families with dual earners. But without more data from the families who didn't agree to be videotaped, we can't know for sure. So we have to accept that there's some uncertainty around the generalizability of these of these findings, knowing that we we do have a biased sample here.
and that the people that were would allow people to come in their homes and videotape them are likely to be are likely to be different than other people. Okay. So, are larger samples always more representative than smaller ones? Not necessarily. It's very important to take into consideration how the sample was obtained. Was the sample obtained um, using a random procedure or was it obtained using a non-probability technique? So we could have a very, very large sample, but if it was a convenient sample, it's not necessarily better. Okay, the sampling technique is more important than the sample size. Sample size does, of course, affect something called the margin of error. So sampling error simply refers to the fact that because we sample a smaller set of individuals out of our population, chances are the statistic that we obtain in our sample will not match the true value in the population. So we can, what we see here is that we've got an average, this is a symbol for population average, uh, and so there's some true population value, some true population average. When we take a smaller set of people and we get a, the average for that sample, the sample mean, what we say is that that mean is likely to be in error, okay? That it's either a little bit high or a little bit low, that there's some sampling error associated with that mean. The larger the sample, the less sampling error there will be. Uh, what we have in this table is the margin of error when making a frequency claim based on several different sample sizes. So what we can say is that if we report a percentage, let's just say the percentage of people that would vote for a particular presidential candidate, when we use a sample that is 2,000, we can say that the margin of error around that percentage would be plus or minus two percentage points. So you can see that as sample size goes up, that margin of error goes down. That is, we can be more confident and report our, um, our claim with a smaller margin of error given a higher sample size.